Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the TF Cast. Today's date is October 19th, 2021. Today with us, we have musician Chad Sabin. Um, today, to talk about an upcoming project, we have going with Cicada Killer and just generally fill us in on all things Chad. Um, Chad, tell us a little bit about the band and what's going on with Cicada Killer. Cicada Killer. It's a heavy project. Probably some of the heaviest stuff I've done. I'm mm. older, but it's the heavier project I've done. Um, you know, four guys here in town. My old buddy Jeff uh, Schnobrick. Mm-hmm. We've got a long history playing together. Uh, Mark Bassett, Kevin Filter. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming together the last... Well, four years, I guess, since Jeff and I first started kind of birthing this idea of uh, giving it one go- one more good go at playing something heavy. And uh, so here we are, you know. I mean, unfortunately, we decided to release this project right in the middle of a pandemic. Who would have <laughs> thought that? Mm-hmm. Uh, as you all know, we were working with you guys a little bit right there as, as things fell apart for all of us, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, it's a good project. Uh, I, I hope. Uh, I hope it. I last as long as the project. Let's put it that way. I'm not getting any younger, and it seems to be getting heavier with each new song we write. Uh, I'm riding the elliptical extra hard so I can play for you all whenever I get to do that again. So I appreciate that. Yeah, come out. I've worked well, hard to be there for you. We, we, we can immortalize you in November. That's for sure. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I'm working out. I'm, I'm working hard on that. What, what were some of those uh, early conversations with uh, Jeff? Like you're, you wanted to take another whack, you said, at the heavy stuff. Where, what, what made you want to go from that and what were you pivoting from? I, I, I can't necessarily say that it was so much a, a conscious it was. There was a con- a conscious conversation involved. Um, there were some beers, and we were sitting. We were downtown at the Hugo Building in the dank basement, and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. spending time at the the Midtown drinking beers beforehand, and and kind of reminiscing as you know, Jeff and I had moved away for um, fifteen twenty years, uh, came back at the exact same time, and uh, it, it was kind of. <laughs> kind of picking up where we left off, I feel. Um, we'd both grown. We'd grown in our influences and what we were listening to and, and what we wanted to accomplish. And you know how it is with musicians. You're thinking about these things, but you're not necessarily talking about them. It's it's definitely something we were, we were feeling in our heart, you know, that we weren't done playing what we had set out to do together. And uh, it didn't take long for the two of us to be down in the basement kicking out songs back and forth and uh it didn't take too long before we realized okay this is this is solid it's it's worth asking some other people to to help us out with this um you know originally we had dave bagulka playing bass which was uh that was awesome and and that that you know moved on to a couple of new guys that i absolutely love who i'd seen i'd seen mark play in war rooster before in town i was super excited um kevin great guy i really love him on bass he's awesome yeah so i think it's a great to me a, you gotta have a certain uh just a balance in personalities i think that really brings a band together and makes it something special i've you know between now and 30 years ago i've had a few bands where it's just Eh, you're just kind of going through the motions, and and this feels very genuine to me, and and at 52, it's making me again play harder than I've ever played in my life to make something really cool happen, and I'm appreciative of that, you know. Yeah, well, we we certainly like it too. It, it's actually when when I was first introduced to you, I, you it was about your DJ project Spivo, um, and like it. But it's like every time someone else has brought up your name, it has to do with a different project. So (laughs) it's been really a treat to like get to um, hear some of these different projects you've worked on over the years. Maybe for the audience, you could break down some of the history of like what you've done and how it influenced you to what you're working on now. Oh, boy. It's a long path. It's Mm -hmm. great, though. I'm very blessed in what I've done. And it all started right here in Mankato. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, Libido Boys, um, just the greatest uh, structure to the beginning of my life as a young boy and a young man coming to, you know, out of Mankato. Um, I was listening to Nate Boots, mm-hmm. correct, the yeah, other day, I mean, and he was talking about, you know, the, the town being small and and far off the map and things. And it was true, and it was even more so in 1988. Mm. It was very small, and it felt very uh, just <laughs> so far out there on the plains to us. And uh, it was those first ventures into Minneapolis and starting to see bigger bands that it really struck me that that was the key to getting out of here. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was, you know, Libido Boys, and and that started with Jeff. And uh, that that taught me a lot about music. It, t- it took me a long ways. It took me to some great record labels. It took me mm-hmm. to a lot of great shows. It took me to so many amazing people across the country, across the world. Um, that was, that. that's about the time, the be- that's kind of like right near the beginning of when that kind of like fabled Mankato, like punk scene was going on in general. It was a very interesting time here. It really cool. was, you know. I I feel uh, we started to get some momentum. We started heading out on the road. We started heading towards Berkeley. San mm-hmm. Francisco area was always super genuine to us, you know, really took care of us. So um, that sound, those bands started to follow us back to the Midwest. And mm-hmm. as we kept traveling we would come home and find those great bands from the west coast we're stopping off in mankato now Mm -hmm. and you know there's fabled stories of some of the great people who have stopped through mankato along the way and uh i'm happy to be a part of that hopefully in some way to is is that how those connections were made is from touring bands coming out and basically connecting word of mouth like i I guess every bit of organizing I've ever done has been in the age of the internet. So Isn't it crazy? <laughs> it's hard uh, to imagine. We had Maximum Rock and Roll. Are you familiar with Maximum Rock and Roll? Yeah, it's a print. It's a print <laughs> zine. It was very small, but it had great circulation. And yeah. I can tell you that Maximum Rock and Roll, an issue of that actually connected to me with everybody in Mankato. Uh, a hmm. buddy of mine slid it under his seat while I was playing drums in uh, orchestra. He was in trombone, and he slid one under the, the seat back to me to see if I would be interested in reading this. Mm. And I was like, what is this? And it was all punk ads, punk 45s, mm. punks with their tour dates coming out. And I was like, what is this? You know, It was yeah. so DIY. And uh, it just struck across the country. And they they liked us. We liked them. Maximum Rock and Roll put us on a compilation at one point with a lot of other great bands from around the country. And, uh, and, and that was really my passport t- to the rest of my life, mm-hmm. really. I mean, mm-hmm. it really was. I, I can't say how much I, I really hand it to Maximum Rock and Roll and the kids who saw that as a ticket to a, a bigger and brighter future than where they were hanging, no matter where they were hanging, Ohio, you know, West Virginia, all these kids we met, we met them through that fanzine. And that mm. was, that was an incredible zine. Yeah. <laughs> it really brought everybody together. Yeah. That, that's awesome. And you, it, it, you said it took you away from Mankato about how long were you gone for? <sighs> well, I st- I moved here in about 87, my junior and senior year, and started playing with Jeff, uh, Dustin Perry, and uh, Devin Waterman were were the originals as Libido Boys. I think that was even before I graduated high school. And um, we had a tour set up to head out for an entire summer about three weeks after I graduated. Mm -hmm. Dustin and I both graduated together. And we hit the road and, and really going back to like Nate's whole thing of just being a small town off the map, I just needed to get out of here. I needed to, you know, I was too big for my own town already as a kid and, and f- needed to fill my oats and off we took on the road. Um, you know, definitely coming back now, I'm, like I said, 52, I moved back here when I was 46. Oh, I wow. left here when I was hmm. 20 three 
And uh, I, it was difficult coming back. It was difficult. I had a lot of those mm. those hangups that made me say, I, I'm, I got to get out of this town still hanging on me. Um, but coming back, you know, after that first year of coming back and kind of being through a little bit of, I don't know, a culture shock um, after traveling around the world and things for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. I was really happy. I'm really happy to be here. Mm. I'm going to take this moment to thank you guys because I think you are a big part of what's making me feel very good about being back in Mankato. Thank you. You are all spotlighting and, and showing us all the creative side of this town. And to me, that's uh, this is a great incubator for this. I get it. A lot of people, you know, the, the great artists, the graffiti artists, the great DJs, everybody's in a big city. But we all start somewhere. And this is a great incubator for creativity and as a young man, I, I saw that here, whether it's cheap rent for a practice space or cheap hall rent for a show or an easy way to hang 300 flyers on some light posts and have 300 kids show up. It's the perfect place to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think you all are, are really helping kind of bring that feeling back to town that it is DIY and important for our community to take care of those things. Too many kids are just really, I'm sounding like the old man now, but too many kids are just like lost in this social media world instead of going out and saying, hey, I wanna, I wanna get sweaty and hang in a show. I mm -hmm. wanna play. I wanna, I wanna hang with my friends. And I don't know, maybe I'm just too old and I'm not hanging, but I'm, I'm still hanging. So where's <laughs> everybody? Where are all the young kids hanging in there? We're, we're I am so play. hungry for an all age show. I've got uh, 10, 10 and a half year old boys and I, they, they need shows and somebody needs to step up. I mean, if I'm the first to get them to boot them in the butt to start doing shows, we've waited too long. So mm. I, we, we, I'm, I love the idea of all age shows and keeping it in the community. Certainly. I, there, we, we do need to have some more all age shows and good organization on that here. I, I, I totally sympathize with you or um, I, I see eye to eye with you on this idea that Mankato is a great incubator and a great place to come for music in general. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it, it is just about showing people what's here because the more people know about it, the more people are going to want to come and stay and, you know, do things here mm -hmm. because it, it was basically just organization that brought all those bands here in the past when Mankato was even smaller. And, uh, you know, we're Metro, you know, hey. technically, you know, <laughs> slid right in <laughs> yeah, close. close enough, close enough for me, close enough for me. Yeah. But, you know, you say organization and I, I do believe that, but there are, there are, there was truly, maybe, again, maybe I'm off the pulse. And I, again, I appreciate you guys for pulling me in as a DJ into this community of DJs and things. And I'm feeling that pulse again here. But as a, as a musician, I, I continue to try to find the pulse in this town of, of youth that are just kicking butt and, and trying to create something unusually cool because... Mm they've got a safe place to do it. And I've lived in major big cities and believe me, it's, it's difficult. The difficulties in creating good music when you're paying out outrageous rent for a space, when you're fighting tooth and nail to get a show, when you're fighting tooth and nail for a crowd, because there's so many other shows, it's mm. it's really difficult, and and this is a great place for young people to cut their tooth on those kind of things, and I I would like to see a lot more of that. Mm. Sure, uh, when you you mentioned like living in some different spots, and I also was just wanting to hear a little bit more about how you pivoted musically in the middle. Um, you you were talking about uh, some punk roots, and then moving over. I, I, I kind of was introduced to you as more of like a chill DJ. Some, I, 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 I would embarrass myself to attempt to put you into a genre. Um, and then also the, the minor threat stuff. That was the one we had a conversation. Minor at, mishap. Minor mishap. Correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. No. <laughs> Different thing. I don't want to be in with minor threat. Excuse me. That's <laughs> too cool for me. Sorry. But um, the, uh, like, how, how did you end up in those, in those situations? Um, I left here tied to a record label when Libido Boys 
dissolved. Uh, we were tied to Red Decibel Records, really great label, indie label out of Minneapolis, um, funded by Warner Brother Records. Uh, Jake Wisely was in charge of that. Just tremendous guy, had so much faith in us. He had also picked up a band, Season to Risk, out of Kansas City. And uh, when Libido Boys dissolved, they asked me to come down. Uh, I was m one of many drummers until they settled on a, an amazing drummer, Dave. And uh, I did that for a few years. And one of my favorite places to play with them was in Austin, Texas, with Season to Risk. We would play emos down there. And so when things fell apart for me in Season of Risk, uh, it was a no-brainer. I just kept heading south. I headed to Austin, Texas. Mm. There's where I did a, a, a large amount of my time, about 25 years. I hung down in Austin, Texas. Um, it wasn't long after I moved out there and, or down there and got into uh, or got out of Season of Risk that I started getting into DJing at that time. Traveling around with uh, Season of Risk, I was starting to pick up records. Uh, there were a lot of shows we were doing in major cities, L.A., things like that. We would finish a punk rock show, and the whole club would change. And suddenly it was a an after-hours rave or a goth club. Ooh. And it was like, holy smokes, this is, this is cool. Well, even First Avenue, you know, we would go to a major show, and then it would turn into a house party after the show and it was all DJs from Detroit and Chicago. I mean, it was early house music and we were right in there dancing as punk rockers after a show at the seventh street entry or whatever, looking forward to the Sunday night dance party. Um, so that just seemed like a no brainer to me. I had spent so many years playing heavy, hard rock that I started like slipping into this strange ambience looking for just noises mm -hmm. and that became the ambient campouts in austin texas which i think are still going on i don't know they're probably on their 200th or more i'm sure <laughs> they've been doing them since you know 25 years ago we started doing those so and they were just campouts where everybody's just laid around in the woods on the beach wherever we decide to do them and just listen to ambient vibes and and strange sounds and I, I still, I just love strange sounds. If I'm not playing drums outright, I'm making strange noises, which nobody would ever understand. And I, I don't look to turn that loose on people, but <laughs> no, I really I, enjoy I it myself. I'm, I'm also, I, I love just making strange noises and going, oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, that you... Have you played any other instruments in bands besides drumming, or has drumming been your primary? You know, drumming is it. Uh, not beyond like an MPD, you know, just a, a, just tapping buttons, things like that. I've sure. never learned to play a piano like most drummers have, mm. and I and I, I do I do feel that has hindered me. I have probably mm. not emotionally released all the things I I think I could <laughs> because of that. So if you're out there, start learning something else, you know, it's mm. important. I think, I think everybody should be able to express herself with an instrument, you know, when you feel down, whenever you're feeling kind of funky, mm -hmm. I think it'd be nice to be able to plunk around on a piano and, and see how I feel and let it come out like that. Certainly. But never, never gotten into it enough to you know, give it a go. Like I say, I plunk around, sure, sure. but it's somebody would go, oh God, that just sounds like garbage. But to my ears, sitting in my <laughs> studio late at night, it's it sounds like a nice soundtrack. And, and that's where I lean more towards soundtracks, things like that. Even mm. with the band now, it, we look at it more as a soundtrack than we do a rock band. Mm. It, is, it is a soundtrack. A uh, soundtrack to what? Whew, that's a good story. I don't know. Something maybe from like Dune. I don't, I don't. Sure. I, I excited or not excited about the new Dune release? How are we feeling? I read all the books. I don't know. I'm keeping myself out of that fight. You okay. know, I am. <laughs> I am the biggest David Lynch fan. Okay. And okay. I'm even with Sting and Dune. I'm still and Sting in a bikini. I'm still a big old fashioned Dune fan. We'll see what happens. If I'm really impressed or not. 
Yeah, a lot of people have a lot of hopes riding on that that <laughs> film, and I'm 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 anxious to see it. But uh, I mean, I, you know, it's happened. It's yeah, there's a few guys in the band that are probably uh, I don't know. I'm gonna hold my tongue. There are much more Dune fans than me, but we'll see. <laughs> What uh? What got you started with drums? How'd you gravitate there? That's a very old story. I, I it was just I probably I was a latchkey kid, and I was lucky enough that uh, I I had a deep basement, and my parents somehow bought a drum kit for me. Mm. I think to keep me busy while they were all gone. Um, I also I also spent uh, s- several nights at a local downtown bar with uh, a bar band playing covers and just sitting on the Mm. edge of the stage after my parents played softball or something and and just I just gravitated towards music you know I could hear the high school kids who had a a garage band down the street and if I heard them I was Mm. down there peeking in the windows trying to get an idea of them you know trying to figure out jump or something from Mm. Van Halen probably older than jump I gotta say that but (laughs) anyways you know, it was definitely, I think it was in my blood. I just, I couldn't stop it. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so what, what, what have you been working on with the band these days? Uh, back to Cicada Killer, maybe. What, what do you got in the works? <clears throat> we, we are in the throes of starting to actually record a record right now. Okay. We're, we're very blessed to have a space that's set up extremely well for us to do it in-house, um, which takes all the pressure off of us. And uh, so that's what we're gravitating towards right now. We've, eh, we've, we've grabbed about a dozen songs that we're really happy awa- about. And uh, okay. I would like to, I don't know, maybe it's a double album with a big gatefold. That's what I'm dreaming about. Mm-hmm. But uh, if it's even a smaller album, I'm super excited. I think, again, the pandemic put us in such a horrible spot we spent almost a year and four or five months just just spinning our wheels i think all of us were heading down to the studio working on things individually um Hmm. but never as a as a total group through all that which which was difficult for all of us all of us but um uh, definitely with Edgar Fest, we that really pulled us back mm. out into the world and and got us moving towards. It's time. It's time to finish this record. Start moving forward. We just have we're sitting on files and files of new ideas. Um, it's time to get this batch out there. Uh, was the Edgar Fest your first show back then? It was. It was. Right. That was a difficult thing to do too. You know, I mean, yeah. with the variant kicking up and everything, everybody was double. Guessing what they were doing, uh, yeah. you know, it was kind of great that it was small for us at the moment that it happened for us. But, yeah. you know, unfortunate for Edgar Fest. Um, and again, what do we do? You know, we just move along with a crazy world as it twists and turns with us. Certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was glad to be there. And I thought it I thought it was in great form, too. I, I mean, we had a few opportunities to come down to your um, practice studio beforehand when you were still in the um, Hugo building and then. The, about a year later hearing what was some of the same stuff at the what's up it was it just sounded great so I, i'm really excited to capture some of that yeah, yeah thank awesome. you is, is it is it going to be um it once you finish up with this is it going to be going to a new kind of soundtrack for a different moment or are you going to try and get out and play this for a period of time What's the what's the writing process like for the band? That's a good that's a good question, and I, I think we need to fully have that conversation yet. It, it was definitely something we were starting to see some shows come up for us in the cities. Um, we were excited to get out and and play some shows. Definitely, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult. We're we're older. Uh, we've got families. A tour is not something that's on the books. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a, it's a handful of shows. It's weekend warrior kind of stuff, you know, heading out here and there to some of the places we know people who, who book great shows. And, and I would like to see that happen. I mean, definitely if we create a new record, it needs to get out there and get sold. So I would love to get out there and push the record. I certainly would. Uh, again, those songs are over a year and a half old. 
and we've really polished them well. And I think they're worthy of getting laid to tape at this point. But I do feel, um, you know, going back to just me loving weird noises, that's what I've been doing the last mm-hmm. year and a half sitting in a mm-hmm. studio alone is running my drum suddenly through a bunch of effects and, and tweaking them out and, and freaking them out and thinking of segues in between these songs. That's where I found myself going over the last year was how do I, how do I take what I know as a DJ and take this set of soundtracks and put them together Hmm. and uh and so it's been a nice way to tie in some of my my skills or the things i like to do while dealing with the world that's kind of gone crazy for a little while you know Hmm. are there any interesting ways that came together uh i'm thinking specifically of like drum kit and effects i know actually zach and i were having a conversation about that just the other day so i'd be curious to know if you got any yeah, I was I'm, I was definitely experimenting a lot this this last year and a half. Um, mm-hmm. I got really good at taking all the effects out of my drums, taking all the EQing out, and what I found was I was uh, I was really experimenting with just three microphones. I broke it down to three microphones, hmm. and and it became just a a whole night of just tweaking it. And just moving the microphones, pulling it away from the bass drum, pulling this one back a little bit, pulling this one that's over here back a little bit, Mm -hmm. and finding where I no longer needed any EQ. How could I work with my room reverb? Mm. And that's when I knew I was dialing in something good. It was just everything was straight up and down on my my mixer, on Mm. the EQs and things like that. and then adding a crazy phaser, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know, adding, adding something, uh, too much reverb and, and just really tweaking it out and making it just sound just like Ooh. it's just vomiting there for a moment and then dialing it back. It's just, <laughs> it became just kind of an experiment. Now, will my band go for it? We'll see when that happens. <laughs> but, but that's part of what I look forward yeah. to over the next couple months is, is the process of just all standing over a board, which is a different process than writing the songs, honing in the songs. It brings out a different relationship when you're all standing over them and looking at them already on the canvas and painted. They're they're on a tape, and then you start tweaking it and seeing how it's all going to come together on a record. Mm. And I think that's a lot of my old DJ habits coming out as well is presentation is very important to me from start to finish. It should be a story. It, to me, it's not a Spotify four minute song Well, we don't have any four minute songs. They're all six, seven, eight minutes, (laughs) but, uh, it, it should really be something. It's like, I'm done with my day. I'm going to eat. I'm going to sit down. Now I'm going to listen to this record. And that's what I want it to be. I want it to be an entire experience and not something you just pick up in your car where you left off. Certain, I, you know, it, it's it's so often we have um, uh, art musicians in here talking about their relationship with the album and how they feel about um, you know the difference between how streaming has gone with the push towards singles and all that stuff, and how they feel about wanting to make an album, even though they don't think that making an album is a great thing to do <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah. I don't know any other way, and I, I maybe it's hindering me by not being on this uh, this fast sampling kind of mm-hmm. on the computer kind of Spotify way of thinking about it. But to me, it's it's a it's a hard product in my hand, and until I have that, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm used to: our kids leaving a show with a record and going home with an experience and sitting down with that and. To me, it's important to have a, a liner note and sit and pour over that as you as you listen to what you're so excited about. I mean, what mm-hmm. an experience! I, 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 do kids even get that anymore? I don't know. I just don't. You know, I, I don't know. Now we, ha- I really like it when I open up Spotify and then it just starts telling me things like 
If you stare at your phone while you're listening to Spotify, it'll be like, behind the music. The artist said the song is about this. And sometimes it'll play like a little clip about the music video. Okay. So I do think we had a little bit of a dead spot, but now it's getting a little bit better with some music education and Mm -hmm. interactive content that comes with just listening to music. Or my phone just thinking I'm in the car. Um, That's not cool. Yeah, but I mean, in, in in the case of in the case of yours, where I I am an album listener, I I really like it when a band can put together a whole album. I, I think all the songs stand up anyway, so you could just release them all as singles anyways, and oh. it'll be fine. Well, I hope like, so. <laughs> I'm sure they'll end up there. I don't know. I honestly, I don't even know anything about Spotify. I really treat try to keep myself away from all that. In some way, I'm just I don't know. I guess I'm just stubborn and old, but. Uh, how, do yeah. you shop for music often? I don't very often. When I do, it's usually very old vinyl. It mm. might be old rock vinyl. I have a list I keep on a bulletin board in the mudroom that I jot things down if I'm looking for them. It's usually, you know, some old reggae or mm. uh, Fela Kuti or it's something I... It's never what's hot or what's coming out on the board at the music store, the record store. Mm. It's usually something I'm digging through a bargain bin to find, or That's unfortunately cool. maybe digging a little deeper online to find. Mm. Well, the good thing about what's hot is it's just always available. We're immersed in it. So you find your own interest elsewhere. You can't avoid, mm. you can't avoid the song of the moment. So just right. leave it where it sits. We're, exactly. That's my thing with that. I, I enjoy it on its terms. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. well <clears throat> i got i i don't have any more specific cicada killer specific questions um i don't think i did either um have you played have you played any of the affected drums with the band yet has that been a live performance thing no. or just studio no and not even so much in the studio although just this last week i set up several several triggers with my kit Okay. And uh, I want to start seeing how that goes. Definitely, mm-hmm. as I move into recording, um, I started throwing some triggers on the on the drums as well to try mm-hmm. to trigger them on different channels and see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds cool. I, I I think it's fun. It's fun to see the different ways that people are playing with combinations of electronic stuff with classic. Uh, the acoustic, do they call it acoustic drums? Is that the <laughs> yeah, yeah, acoustic right. drums, Regular, acoustic tubs. natural, yeah, the good old. <laughs> I do have a I do have a pretty good collection of bass drums right now. Oh yeah, and they come out on stands from time to time with some Ooh. big mallets, and that's been a lot of fun. So I do really Ooh. feel like whenever the next album comes out, there will be a lot of very sub low end to all this, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to tweak some of those bass drums to, to fill in the low end. That sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. That and the six string bass. I was, I thought that, I thought that was a baritone guitar and I was so excited to see that that was a six string bass. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Is that what Kevin was rocking? Yeah. I I asked him, I was like, Oh, I didn't know you had a baritone. He's like, actually it's a six string bass. I was like, fine, I'll just go over there, I guess. (laughs) It is exciting. It's exciting to see Kevin come up with some new sounds. I I really give him a lot of credit. He's definitely stepped up my game as well with some of the things he's come up with. He's got Mm -hmm. a synthesized, you know, bass connection to it now and it's Uh, making some really nice sounds for him. So I mean, definitely, we should be on some big PA somewhere, rumbling people's guts. I hope that happens yet. <laughs> that sounds I'm, cool. I'm sure it will. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about, uh, oh, shoot, I was going to ask about Cicada Killer. I forgot. I lost it. Oh, you're good. Oh, it was, no, nope, lost it still. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great question. I was saving it right until the end. It was about... It was about Cicada Killer. I think it was about Cicada Killer. It it ought to be. <laughs> um, hmm. Sound, light, video, influences, history. Nope, got nothing. 
Yeah, just wait for the... Vi- or there's going to be a video in November. That's the moral yeah, of the story. I, I look forward to it. It's going to yeah. be fun. And again, I, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. I, I just keep saying it. You guys are very infectious, and and it, uh, it's inspiring me to see you guys around town doing your thing, helping everybody out. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Oh, I remembered. Ah! Um, okay, so <laughs> as someone who's been in a band here at some point in the history that got pretty popular and you've done some traveling and have returned. I'm curious what you might say as uh, either takeaways that you yourself learned from your experience or if you would be so bold as to give some soft advice to the musicians who are younger and coming up in this town, like um, just things they can keep in mind or like uh, how to scale their ambitions or what's, what's a good path for that. I think you hit it right there in scaling your ambitions and, and really being, uh, first of all, what the music industry is today is not what it was when I was growing up. It, it was definitely, maybe it's even better. I don't know. You can put stuff out in band camp. You mm-hmm. can do a lot of things I couldn't do. Um, for us, it was, it was a very slow process. You send away vinyl to have test press and then you got to hear the test press and then you send it back and it's months later you get a a seven inch and then you're ready to go on tour and it was just a very slow process i very early in the game i had no idea what i was getting into so everything was very exciting and i had no expectation beyond what's gonna wow me tonight at a gig um I got to the point where I was traveling in some bigger vehicles and staying in hotels, and I thought that's always what I wanted. And I quickly really missed sleeping on the crazy kid's floor in Tacoma, Washington, with static on the TV that he wouldn't let us turn off. I missed that story. <laughs> I, I missed the guy who was, you know, making us eat hot chili peppers in it from his garden in Sioux city, you know, because Ooh. we ended up at his house and staying there. We don't know how we ended up there. I, just, just enjoy it. It's, it's such a great ride to just get out there and play music and meet people. Ooh. I would not plan on trying to be rich and famous or anything, but good Lord, there's so many amazing moments to just get off your couch create a dozen songs with some friends and feel good about just that. But if Mm. you can then take that to a little bar in Mankato and have the same dozen friends I have come out that are amazing, you know, Mm -hmm. get your best friends out there. I'll just, you know, I can't, I can't stop without saying, you know, Opgu, that's what we called it. It was Mm. Opgu is us giving energy to our friends who fed us energy from the crowd. And sometimes that would start to cycle and it would cycle. And, and this was during libido boys and, and Billy Bassan, our singer would just become frenzied on stage. And the more the crowd reacted, the more he reacted and the higher the energy would always go. And it didn't matter if there was five people somewhere in a, Pennsylvania small town or it was 400 kids when we were playing in Sioux Falls South Dakota or here mm-hmm. it, it, we could turn that into the best show ever I, I can literally say that some of the best shows we ever played were to three four people mm. I mean there was a show we played for nobody and we turned our backs to a couple of drunks on a bar stool and and had a great practice and really had fun, you know? Mm. You just got to kind of roll with what happens out there and really make it about, this is for me as much as for them, and and find that connection and, and really mm. just enjoy yourself. Otherwise, you're going to get really disappointed really fast, I feel. Mm. I, I, that really resonates with me because I, I feel like there's a lot of like immediate pressure to monetize and like start making steps to like push your music into like social media and like record some and do this. But like most of my like most fond memories of music are just me playing music with my friends and like doing that and all the other stuff like, yeah, you do it because you, you, you want to find more, you know, you, you want to push that further and make more opportunities. But like, 
you know, I started doing those things because that's what I wanted to do anyways. You yeah. Know? So. That takes you around to the beauty of a small town like this with a small group of friends. You're, you're protected. You're amongst your friends. Go, yeah. go nuts. Kids need to go out there and go nuts and, ha- and, and start something cool. Create. Don't be afraid to create for your friends. Then what a great opportunity to do it living here in Mankato. I hear that. I feel like that's a great place to just send it. Yeah, I do too. Do you want to do yeah. some plugs and let people know where they can find the band? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, really all we got is that crazy Facebook world and we got Cicada Killer page on Facebook. You know, it's full of some old videos. Again, it's it's been a tough year, and I, I hope with your help we, we start getting some fresh things up there. Uh, it's a good time to just plug in and, and watch and be notified when uh, here in another month or so things start really starting to take hold for us again, some momentum. Sure, yeah, and the 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 the, the shadowy plan we've been alluding to all of this episode is that we're just going to be doing another uh, live session. Um, you know, not not we're not going to reveal the location, but very similar to what you saw in the the Capitol room where we we get the whole band together and and film a longer set and uh, you know just just go all out and you know make it a good time for everyone. So look mm-hmm. forward to the Triple Falls live session with Cicada Killer. And uh, if you got any other plugs for any of the other projects, if people want to. Uh, check out any of the stuff we discussed today i really don't i just you know everybody keep your ear to the ground and i don't have anything so go create something well there you go there we are do it thank you for joining us thank you guys i appreciate it very much we all do thank you